celebration of Easter today and the fact that it's our final show of the season, we're going to leave Teo's top tip for today and we're not <laughs> going to give you a hard time at any point about being wrong again last week. Grace Gill, you called the Big Blue at Leichhardt Oval today. Premier's plate on the line, but also finals football starting right now for Melbourne Victory and gee whiz, they were up for the task. Well, it was a genuine knockout game for Melbourne Victory. Had they lost, that would have been season over for them. So for Sydney FC, they needed a win and that would have handed them the Premier's plate. Melbourne just needed a draw. They got so much more than that. This was such a dominant performance from Melbourne Victory. From start to finish, they looked defensively disciplined, they had numbers everywhere, and we know how good Sydney are as well. They have the best defence in the league. But four goals today, this very, very controversial talking point, uh, the second of the two, but it was a masterclass from Victory Teo. Victory looked like a totally different team with Beattie Goad in the team, and that's been the case for a lot of the year. But Grace, what about bringing Jessica Nash back into the starting 11? Alana Murphy, both of them now an extra week back from that young material tour, Alex Chidiak rounds out the scoring here. And at least Kellen Knight back on the bench. It feels as though when it came to the crunch, Victory's best available team started to make itself more available and they got a, a great result with all of those people back. Well, Jeff Hopkins does as Jeff Hopkins does in finding a way for his team. And the fact that those players came back into the starting 11 also meant that you had the likes of Privatelli, KK on the bench, these world-class players as your substitutes. And when they did make that first change, that was the third goal for Victory. It was done and dusted by then. Looking at that first change then, because you mentioned Jeff Hopkins and his prowess as a coach, that change meant that Emily Gilnick moved into the middle of the park and you and Ish identified it in the call how big a change that was because she's covering huge metres at the moment, getting back to defend as well as her task at the front of the park and it had an immediate impact. Is that something yeah. that we might see him do from the get-go in the elimination finals? Well, it may well be yeah. and what it meant is that Em was pushed centrally where she can be a great hold-up player and she was, on her first touch in that position, found the back of the net. Whether or not he does it in the finals or still has the options, because he has the luxury of these players coming off the bench, changing things up and Em's such a good player down the wing as well and has the, the versatility of playing either centrally or out wide. Sydney's defending. Is this a tipping point? We know that they've been uh, without Nat Tobin the entire season. Is Kirsty Fenton the final straw that maybe too many regulars and maybe their best out, you know, aerial defender, particularly on that corner for the first goal? Or do you think that the replacement players they've put in there can work it out with a couple of weeks to recalibrate? I think they can recalibrate um, and I'd say especially so because Margot Chauvet was probably the standout performer today for Sydney FC in the left fullback position. She's really grown in stature across the course of the season so I think she's a pretty good replacement. She got forward a lot which can leave Sydney a little vulnerable at the back in that space but when you've got McLean who had another decent game for the most part as well uh, I, I do think they've got the quality. They just need a little, a little time evidently to reset and regroup and go again. A huge moment in the game was that penalty decision and Jada Wyman kicking out at Chids in the box. Teo, how did you see it? And is this a moment that showed just how frustrated Sydney FC were at this point in the game? I, I can't believe that, you know, with the red card having the potential to knock you out of both legs of the semi-final or worse, that you take that sort of a risk. I mean, the referee has just flat out got this wrong. Casey Rybelt. Um, we saw the Vicky Bruce red card in the Sydney Derby get overturned. Because a yellow card's been given on the field here, it won't be revisited. So Jada, very, very lucky. I mean, some Sydney FC fans seem to think that it, a yellow was fine, Grace. Do they have a leg to stand on? Or to me, that's a red card offence. No, my first interpretation of it was wrong in that I thought you couldn't get a double, a double jeopardy in that case, as in you couldn't get both a red card and have the penalty awarded against you. Um, and then we clarified on air that, in fact, when it's a non-footballing foul, as Jada's was, the lash out, the violent conduct, you can, in fact, have a red card and a penalty, which it should have been indeed in that case. So that result, one, means that Melbourne Victory play finals football once again. So congratulations to Victory who are storming into the finals. But it also, Teo, opened the door for Melbourne City to claim the Premier's plate. I think the Premier's plate was there in Sydney, ready to be awarded to the Sky Blues. That couldn't happen. And Melbourne City showed that while we've discounted them at times this season, we do so at our own peril. Top spot's been a poison chalice. It's almost been like a reverse race to the finish line. Western United were five points clear uh, barely a month ago, let's not forget. Melbourne City, they clutched it out here. Rihanna Policina, she missed the derby a few weeks ago with a knee concern. No concerns about that goal. A brilliant strike. And that allowed Melbourne City to dictate 
uh, play the way that they do, 60% possession, and, and play Grace with a degree of comfort, but 1-0, very slender margin. It wasn't until late that Shelby McMahon, the 15-year-old, popped up and scored the second goal for a 2-0 buffer. At this point, Sally James has been subbed in for Morgan Aquino, Perth getting a look at some of the players that hadn't had much game time this year. And, uh, well, it wouldn't be the A-League women's without a little twist in the tail after this goal gave them a 2-0 buffer, albeit in the 89th minute. Well, first of all, huge moment for Shelby McMahon, a 15-year-old. What a moment to score your debut professional goal. But for sure, I think City 2, maybe in a similar vein to that of victory, they had Danny Garlitz returning to the bench, they had Tian McKenna, so their young Matildas coming back into the side, really solidifying a group, giving them more options off the bench. Chinema as well. Chinema, of course. Uh, and I think that's exactly what that did. Good for Tanika Lala, 19 years old, scores her first goal. Perth had a lot more uh, locals and homegrowns this season. Still haven't won a game since December the 31st, but at least they gave their fans something to cheer and they made City earn it all the way to the finish line. City Teo have had defensive issues thwart them at times this season. We know they have a really clear philosophy in the way that they play and they back themselves in to score more goals than they concede. But over the last couple of months, they've really got that defensive setup working and it's paid dividends. That is only that Tanika Lala goal there is only the second goal they've conceded since January. It's two in seven games, Grace. Mm. They they were a minute away from keeping six clean sheets out of seven, which for Melbourne City, who were, you know, in shootouts and real ding dong battles for the first half of the season, it shows that they've adjusted and, you know, without the dynamism of Holly Mack there leading the attack and being able to outscore their opponents, now they look like a different team. Yeah, and we've got to remember as well the departure of Caitlin Torpy mid-season too. I think Taylor Otto has been a really important part to their defensive shape because she can either play as a centre-half or push up a little into the midfield and, of course, Stoddy as well. Such an experienced player. Um, Organising from the back for City. Let's not underestimate Carly Ross back and clocking mm. up regular 90s every week as well. This was a player who was in the Matildas and has been crueled yep. by injury for the last three years. And now that she's actually starting to string some games together, Melbourne City are benefiting as a result. I love these celebration scenes. They were well aware of what has happened earlier in the day and what this result meant. It also means, GG, that they've got effectively three weeks off. There's the international window, then a week off to watch the elimination finals. How does City avoid losing any momentum yeah, over the next few weeks? That's always the question when you go into this, this space of having to see weeks out onto your next game. And I think it's a benefit in a sense of if any player is nursing any knock or injury concern, of course you get that time. But you want momentum. They're going to have to keep ticking over at training, whether they organise some in-house internal friendly games. They've got to keep turning over their legs because they need that going into finals. Alessandro Diamanti, the boys' academy coach, get your, your 14s, <laughs> your 15s, maybe your 16s ready. ready. You're going to have a game. <laughs> <laughs> Lots to look forward to for both City and Sydney FC, who know they've got that week off. Tell you who else is in the finals. And it is the Central Coast Mariners, 14 years after their last start in the Liberty A-League. Their first season back and they're straight back into to finals football. Key part of that heading into the pointy end of the season is Matilda and Mariners forward Kai Simon. Kai has been good enough to join us on Dove Zone this evening. Kai, it's so good to see you. Thanks for having me on, guys, and happy Easter. A very happy Easter to you as well. Can I ask you about the culture there at the Mariners to begin with? Because throughout this first season back in the comp, it has felt like under Emily Husband, you've developed such a strong bond that's helped on the field as well as being really solid off it. Yeah, look, I think um, when we first came in as a group, there wasn't a lot of us that had played together. It was almost a completely new squad, players from all different teams, different parts of the globe. Um, and basically, um, one consistent theme is that we have just a great group of girls and really great people. And I think that makes it so easy when you come into work to get along with, you know, the, the girls in the dressing room, but also, you know, be able to work on the pitch as well as we do off the pitch and... Um, just a really great group of, of humble girls that want to learn and they're really eager to learn and buy into what Em is, is trying to do with us on the coast here. So um, for me, it's been really enjoyable to be a part of this group and it's just such a great group of girls that I love sharing the dressing room with. Kai, you've played under a number of different managers over your career. How has it been working with Emily Husband, both of those things that you've mentioned there in the cultural off-the-field aspects, but tactically as well on the field? How have you found Emily in her debut A-League season? Yeah, the first time I've been coached, coached by Em, and I think uh, one thing that she's instilled in us as a group is to be versatile and flexible, and I think that is, is evident in the way that our season's gone. We're very 
um, versatile in terms of the formation that we play and, and buying into that week in, week out. And I think that's a strength of ours is the ability to be able to shift formations and play in different systems, no matter who we're playing against. And, and M's definitely set us up for that from the start of the season, which I think has benefited us and, and caused trouble for other teams that we've faced throughout this year. Kyra, it's safe to say that the Mariners' resume is you know, a pretty unheralded group. Yourself and Casey Dumont were the only two players with Matilda's caps in the squad. How have the team sort of adopted the idea of A-League women's football at a high level week in, week out? Many of them are NPL players in their first season. Some of them are players who've had a go at one or two other clubs but never cracked it. So what have you seen in the group as they've responded to the challenge of a full 22-week campaign? Yeah, look, if there's one thing that I can say about the girls is there's buy-in and there's the ability and the willingness to work hard. And that's day in, day out. No matter what we're faced with, no matter what challenges we're faced with off the pitch, on the pitch, the girls are there to work hard, to learn and to want to excel and grow as a team. And um, again, that's what's been so great for me to be able to come into a team with no big egos, just the willingness of the team to want to work together to buy in from the coach and just get the job done and um, also I guess that um, receptiveness of taking on information whether it be from us you know older more um, I guess players in more leadership roles um, whether it's the coaching staff whatever that may be I think that willingness um, and the eagerness to learn and um, I guess that really doesn't put a you know a lid on on our potential and, and where we can take this season and, and that's the exciting part of being a part of this team. I wanted to ask you about Peter Trimmer specifically as well. We saw her score three goals for the young Matildas when they were away in Uzbekistan recently, and she's had a great first season in the A-League women's, but what do you see in her, uh, especially as a player that you can potentially mentor, given that she does play in the attacking third? Yeah, look, she's tenacious, she's quick, um, she's so well-balanced and really great with her feet in tight, small areas, and... Um, you know, one thing about Peter is she just got a great head on her shoulders. She's a really good, good girl. She is willing to learn. She um, is really respectful and just a great person to have around the team. So she's got a bright future ahead and um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what she can do. And I'm sure she'll be in a Matilda's jersey one day. What about for you personally, Kaya? You've had a tough run with injuries. You've had to work so hard to make it back onto the pitch this season. Where are you at physically? How are you feeling heading into the finals? Yeah, look, I um, just about clocked my first 90 um, against City a couple of weeks ago. Then with a the short turnaround leading into the Western game, um, I managed my minutes to about 45, um, which was... Yeah, from the, from the medical staff and the coaching staff, probably the smartest thing to do. Um, but feeling really good. I think each week that goes by, each, I guess, uh, game that I get more minutes under my belt, I guess the intensity that I can attack games at a little bit more, growing that confidence on the pitch in my body, but also just that confidence to play like me and play freely, I think, without even thinking about my body. I think that's when I know that's when, I know when I'm at that, at, that, that point of, I guess, being fit, firing, you know, no hesitation and just being able to play freely. And I'm definitely there or on the cusp of being there and um, perfect timing with finals around the corner. But um, I think for me, being here at home, being on the coast, being a part of a club that values me so much as a player, um, having my loved ones surrounding me, um, it's really been the best, I guess, formula that, I, that I've needed coming off such a difficult 15 months. Um, yeah, trusting in my body, enjoying being back in Australia, um, being in warm weather, um, I think it's really opened my eyes up to the things that are most important um, to me and just, I guess, given me a really fresh mindset um, to be able to give my best version of myself on the pitch and also to my teammates um, who see me every day, uh, you know, week in, week out. But, um, yeah, I'm feeling great. I'm really looking forward to the finals around the corner and um, hopefully, yeah, we can take it all the way with the Mariners this season. So, Kai, without looking too far ahead, what's next for you, the next 12 months, goals and aspirations? What do you think? Yeah, look, to put it simply, I mean, to get into 90 minutes week in, week out, I know we're kind of edging towards the end of the season and um, obviously with finals football coming up with the A-League All-Stars game, there's a few key dates uh, in mind for me. Um, you know, not going to discount um, my Matildas, you know, hopes and dreams to get myself back established back in the team um, but at the same time you know I want to make sure that when I do go back in like I said I'm fit and firing and I've got no 
hesitations or I'm not modified in any way in terms of training load, match minutes, whatever that looks like. Um, so, of course, Olympics is is a goal of mine, whether that happens, whether I've got enough time to build minutes leading into that, um, that that's up to kind of what that training regime looks like post-season. Um, but, uh, yeah, definitely they're the, the first things, um, uh, you know, first goals, I guess, on my list. And, um, you know, never like to look too far ahead, but I think knowing what the, the next, you know, three to four five months looks like um then I'll, I'll i guess reassess what what my football career looks like beyond that time frame and in the much shorter term victory away in this elimination final now a narrow loss to victory in melbourne a draw in gosford so you've run them close twice uh is casey dumont already talking about the possibility of a penalty shootout against her former team and <laughs> how do you feel about the prospect of facing victory <laughs> Uh, yeah, look, I mean, victory are a quality side. They uh, showed that today against um, the almost premiers in Sydney FC. Um, they're a great team on paper. And um, when we face them, um, obviously, it's been a really competitive match. So um, we know that any team in the top six is, was going to be a competitive game and, um, you know, a bit of a battle. And it's been like that the two times that we've faced them this season. So really looking forward to it. There's been no talk from Casey about any penalty shootout or anything alike, but... Um, Hopefully we can get the job done uh, in the 90, but um, it's definitely going to be a cracker of a game. So um, I'm sure, you know, with a week to kind of gather our thoughts this week and get prepared um, to, to face them down in Melbourne, it's going to be a great game. And, yeah, really looking forward to it. And who was behind the rowboat celebration? And do you have anything left? <laughs> Oh, i got to give the credit to Faye, Roller and Ash. Um, there were discussions of that in the, in the change room um, before the game and I just happened to clock onto it as I was running over uh, to, to work out what they were doing and joined in as if I was a part of it from the get-go. But um, I'm sure we've got some celebrations up our sleeves, so hopefully we can keep um, yeah everyone entertained with those leading into finals. We cannot wait to see, particularly at the home of the Matildas, when you take on Melbourne Victory in that elimination final. Kai Simon, thank you so much for joining us on Dub Zone. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Great to see you. Kai uh, back playing good football, helping the Mariners into that final. What about for West United, who the Mariners played midweek? Showed plenty of promise, Gigi. We've kind of counted them out in a lot of ways because they have this ever-mounting injury list and such important players missing, but they showed some promise in this game. Yeah, they did, and I think that speaks to their heart, their resilience, but it's such a tough position for Western United to be in. You mentioned the ever-mounting injury list. We know Chloe Legazzo, long-term hip injury, Hannah keen of course with that ruptured patella tendon they're injuries that are going to put players out for a really long time and they're their leaders on the park of course adriana taranto as well can't go past her but this performance showed that there's depth in the squad that perhaps hasn't been tested fully yet um, so it was really promising to see and it provides a little bit of hope for the next coming weeks. And they're creating. Chiara Di Demisio finishes this chance here. It's a good finish, her first A-League women's goal. But against Western Sydney Wanderers, they had more than 2xG before Wanderers even took a shot in that game. In this match, they kept creating. They're continuing to make chances. So it's up to the likes of Di Demisio, Catherine Zimmerman, Avani Prakash. There is hope for Western United. Don't jump off them just yet. They're in the finals and they'll take on Newcastle in the elimination final, Teo, who beat Adelaide United 8-0. They knew going into this game that they needed to win and they showed up with the biggest win in their history. That is some way to head into finals. And the most amazing thing about it is they scored eight and Serena Bolden didn't have to score <laughs> one. Yes, she had three assists. But I think, Grace, this showed there were many avenues to goal for Newcastle. Uh, Cass Davis celebrates Game 150 by getting the scoring underway, just her third career goal in 150 games. And once the tap was on, it did not go off. I mean, in the second half, we see Melina Reyes come in, but before that, Lara Gooch back from Young Matildas in fantastic form. Lauren Allen, arguably the most underrated player in the league, continuing her sensational form goals in three games in a row. This was a real showcase of everything that can go right from a Newcastle point of view. I think it was, and this is a Newcastle Jets team firing on all cylinders. And I think when you've got so many different goal scorers, that is such a hard prospect to defend against because you can't just focus on one player and say, well, we've got to close down Melina Ayres or we've got to close down Serena Bolden because if you close down those two, evidently another player is going to score. Now, that fifth goal was Emma Dundas, who until Shelby McMahon today, at 16 years old, was the youngest player to score a goal this season and McMahon at 15 only just beat that today. Melina Ayres, two doubles in consecutive weeks. We know she's big at finals time. Scored 
won an elimination final against Adelaide, scored a hat-trick in the elimination final last season. And Alex Hyun, who is playing in her last A-League women's season, put the full stop on it with goal number eight. And a clean sheet as well, which considering the goalkeeping situation which we discussed the week before, Taya was really significant for them. They signed Tiana Robertson, the 21-year-old, on Tuesday. She played on Friday. She made seven saves. And that, from a Newcastle perspective, heading into an elimination final is very important. And 70 million people now know who Izzy Nino is. But what they, <laughs> what they probably don't know is that Izzy Nino still has one more game to serve. She got two games, not three, which is crucial. Means she could be back for the first leg of a semi-final if Newcastle get through. But... Um, Robertson was a uh, emerging Jets youth team player, since went to University of New South Wales. Grace, I think this is evidence that there are lots of good keepers out there. It's just that no one, you know, unless you really, you know, your work circumstances allow you to, you don't sign up to be a backup keeper. This is probably the area that when the league goes full-time pro, anyone who can be a goalkeeper at this level will actually put their hand up to do it. There are lots of good keepers out there, but a bit like Courtney Newbon, unless you're a number one, mm. you don't want to disrupt your life to go and sit on the bench for 22 weeks. That or if you're sort of young enough and in a position that you can do so and learn from a super experienced goalkeeper. But what a what an occasion for Tiana Robinson. <laughs> Not just the 8-0, the, the clean sheet, but she kept them in the game because we oh, saw a few of the, the quality of those shots. They weren't mm. easy saves. And this is a keeper who, as you mentioned, Nevo, signed on Tuesday, plays on Friday. What a debut. Let's look at Wellington taking on the Western Sydney Wanderers. The Wanderers, Tao, in this game with everything to play for and yet it was the Knicks who got the win at home and Hook said afterwards that it's kind of the story of the Wanderers' season. They've beaten the big teams and failed when they were favourites to really step up when they needed to and this one cost them a spot in the finals. Yeah, they, they'll be ruining this because they lost home and away to Adelaide who won the wooden spoon, home and away to Wellington Phoenix who missed the finals, one point against the Brisbane Roar and they dropped points to Canberra as well. They they picked up one point from 18 against teams that finished below them on the table. And, Grace, this is to not to take anything away from Wellington, who really outplayed Western Sydney Wanderers in this game. And they themselves will be thinking about their road form, about a couple of sliding doors moments in close games, and thinking, hey, we were good enough to make the yeah. six this year. Yeah, and I think everyone who has watched any of Wellington throughout the season would have thought exactly that. This is a team, though, with no pressure on them playing perhaps one of their best games of the season. So, of course, they'd sit back and reflect and say, well, why couldn't we play like that? But it's because they didn't have the pressure. Western Sydney were sitting there needing the result and, as we saw today, have been bumped out of the top six. Heartbreak for Robbie Hooker and the Western Sydney girls. But Wellington, that's them at their best. Mm. Adelaide, we spoke about earlier, but for Wellington as well, who have missed out on finals this season, they played, as you've both said, some really good football at times. Teo, I loved watching them when they were at their best this mm. season. They just need to get that on-the-road mm. ability next year and they will push all the way. It's a hard nut to crack, though. I mean, we've seen professional sporting teams from Perth, you know, from New Zealand, playing in Australian competitions, AFL, Super Rugby... It's hard to fix. If you have the best team on paper, that helps. If you have a marginal team, you have to get so much right in the preparation. And they're going to spend a lot of time in the off-season Wellington Phoenix devising a way to pick up more points away from home. I'm very interested as to which of their foreign players they will keep, which ones will move on and, and look further afield, and which ones they might be able to retain. Because their recruitment worked out, I think, for the most part, pretty well this season. They got a lot younger, but they also got a lot better than last season's team. We had one game, DG, this weekend that couldn't have an impact on finals. That was when Brisbane took on Canberra. Canberra got the bickies in this one. What it did see was Michelle Heyman continue to do what she has done all season long. And in this game, she equaled Sam Kerr's goal-scoring record this season. In a season where Canberra have struggled, she has been remarkable. Mm. It's extraordinary to think that Canberra have been more or less at the foot of the table for the whole year, but they are also carrying the leading goal scorer, one of the best young players in the league mm. in Vesna Milivojevic. And it almost has a sense of inevitability about Michelle Heyman at the moment this season. When games just wore on and Michelle would pop up in a moment and not even scrappy goals. That's a really good quality first touch to create a little bit of room for her Herself. And she's done that time and time again for Canberra. It's been a standout season for Michelle. It felt like it was always going to be Michelle and she stood up at a time when it mattered. 
And for Brisbane this year, Teo, they've created opportunity, they've won games, they've looked good at times under Alex Smith, but just really struggled without that solid goal scorer that Michelle Heyman so clearly is for the raw at the front. Is that their key signing in the off-season? I, I think it is. And, and look, during the week they had great news with Sean Fryer getting called into the Matildas squad. First opportunity for her. A player who's come back from an ACL reconstruction as well and so has it all to prove going and joining the Matildas in camp in the USA. But, you know, we're, we're trying to find the positives out of a season for Brisbane where they had quite a mature squad. You know, they went back to Queensland, they looked at adult players, but ultimately, you know, they'll be pleased that they've developed someone to get identified for the Matildas out of this campaign, one where they'll feel as though they left a lot of goals on the table with the quality of chances they created. Yeah, and terrific news, as you say, for Sean Fryer this week. So, after 22 rounds, let's have a look at what that means for the Liberty A-League ladder heading in to the finals. And it means Melbourne City Premier's play for them. They clinched it with victory over Perth Glory this afternoon, but for both City and Sydney, they will have a week off and our elimination finals will be played at Teo between Western United and the Newcastle Jets. Melbourne victory will take on the Central Coast and I guess... For a team like the Wanderers, they're sitting there tonight licking their wounds, Tao, about what may have been. I mean, they've missed out on goal difference in the end. There's been a lot made of wins being the primary tiebreaker, but same number of wins as the Newcastle Jets, and that 8-0 ultimately proved crucial in Newcastle leapfrogging them for the final round. But, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the one thing about the ladder that jumps out to me is Adelaide. The last time they won the wooden spoon, they won three games out of 12. This season, they've won four games out of 22. I mean, minus 35 goal difference, the next worst is minus eight. I think that, you know, Adelaide, I think it's it's pretty tough to put it on the coach or even the players. It's about resources. And the risk is you don't want your wooden spooner to be hanging off the bottom of the closest season ever that far deviated off the rest. Let's have a look at what it means for finals matchups with our elimination finals coming up, of course, the week after our international window. We've got the international break next weekend and we'll see Western United take on the Newcastle Jets at Tarnit, a double header there that day before Melbourne victory take on the Central Coast Mariners. Tao, Cat Smith looking for solutions on the injury front. We've mentioned it in the show already. Can she find them in time to not just be creating opportunities against the Jets, but to find the goals you need to win in an elimination final. Well, and the fascinating thing is these teams played each other three weeks ago. So they've got the tape, and the Newcastle Jets have never won a final, don't forget. They, they only made the old top four twice, and they lost both of those semi-finals. So mm -hmm. there is a degree of pressure on Newcastle. The, the wild card factor is Molina Rez is a big game player and scores goals in finals. So I don't think, you know, you'd write Western United off for this one. They do have home ground advantage, but the Newcastle Jets will feel as though they've never had a better opportunity to win a semi-final. What about the other semi, though, Grace? Well, the well, other elimination. Melbourne victory, Central Coast Mariners. I think Central Coast Mariners watching on seeing Victory's performance tonight would have made them a little nervy because that was a formidable performance from Victory. But that said, looking across the course of the season, and I was just looking at the ladder there, 10 wins apiece for the season, and the main differential being the goal scored by Victory. So Victory have that out-and-out goal-scoring ability that Central Coast have lacked a little bit. But that said, we've seen Central Coast outperform expectations by all means. So going into this kind of game, the pressure, in my eyes, is all on the Victory Girls. And they're so hard to score against the Mariners as well, aren't yep. they? That game, a Sunday Arvo at the home of the Matildas. And I remember from your previous call, a certain Aperol Spritz Hill, it will be <laughs> the place to be in Melbourne that weekend. Let's have a look at our Liberty Ones to watch. Our pundits have voted on these each month throughout the season. Our best young players in the Liberty A-League had to be 21 or under at the start of the season. Let's have a look at the last five rounds to begin with and see who is featuring in our Liberty Ones to watch. I'd love to know from both of you, and it's not just the two of you responsible for these uh, top five, who really stands out for you, Gigi? Who's impressed you? Well, someone who's caught my eye, and not just for the last two hours of uh, football, but Shelby McMahon for Melbourne City. You mentioned, Teo, the 15-year-old. She scored tonight. That was her fifth appearance in the Liberty A-League. But every time she's come off the bench or started that for the City, she's looked so comfortable. And I can assure you, when I was 15, I did not look that composed and assured 
forward on the ball. She is such a tidy midfielder and I've really enjoyed seeing her step up to this stage. I mean, all the credit to Kaylee Talon Henneker, who came in when the young Matildas went away. And again, I think the reason that we've had such variance in who our ones to watch has been because of international call-ups and the ebbs and flows of form. But Talon Henneker, a mid-season signing. Ella Buchanan, who had the three votes there, also a mid-season signing. They've been signed for a reason because they're in form and they're ready to play at this level. And it's a credit to both the coaches and both the clubs for creating a training environment where a train-on can step up so seamlessly. As you say, no one has won five points twice this season. So let's have a look at the overall standings then at the end of the regular season. Our Liberty ones to watch. You mentioned it already, Gigi. Vesna Milivojevic in a side that has struggled at times this year. She has been such an incredible standout. Well, I think we can recall pretty comfortably at the start of the season how exciting Milivojevic was to watch every game for Canberra, whether it was Heyman or Vesna. It felt like she was going to produce something. She's got this air of confidence about her that she brought to this Canberra United team. And there was times where you could really get the sense that she was taking games on her back and saying, well, I'm going to make this happen. And she did that on a few occasions. I mean, it's safe to say the knock to the knee she suffered while scoring a hat-trick against Brisbane curtailed her a bit. The trips overseas to play for Serbia, very busy international breaks in Europe have also slowed her down a bit. But she signed off with her 10th goal of the season against Brisbane. Double figures uh, for a, a winger or an attacking midfielder is a pretty good campaign. I think it could have been so much more if she hadn't had that knee scare against Brisbane, though, because she was on track for so many more. Yeah, and an incredible season from Vesna Milivojevic. Let's have a look at our season highlights now because it is our last dub zone of the season and, indeed, the final round of the regular season has wrapped as well. So before we hear from both Grace and Teo, let's hear from two of our other dub zone panellists, Alicia Ferguson and Catherine Canulli, on their season highlights. Harding from distance. Sophie Harding, are you kidding me? Ayers, shot onside. Incredible. Wonderful save. Happy Easter, everyone. So I've loved getting back to Australia and watching the A-League Women's this season. And I think one of my favourite moments after the disappointment of not making the World Cup squad and then of injury early in the season, it was great to see Emily Gilnick come back from Melbourne victory and score some worldies. Gilnick catches Collins off her line. Incredible. My old Brisbane Raw teammate, really pleased to see her smashing in goals again. And now the volley! Great save into this! My favourite moment of the Liberty A-League season was the opening match between Sydney FC and the Western Sydney Wanderers at Allianz Stadium. What a cracking crowd we had. The place was absolutely buzzing and really showed what we can do in this country for women's football. Far out, that feels like a long time ago, Nulls, <laughs> but you're right. We were there that day too, GG. There was such a vibe about the place off the back of the Women's World Cup. That was a great night. What stood out for you across the course of the season? Well, one moment I can't look past is Unite Round. And I know it was the first concept of Unite Round, but I really enjoyed the weekend having all the games in New South Wales. And one particular standout moment from Unite Round was, of course, Michelle Heyman hitting her 100th A-League goal. And not just her 100th, she just went on to score another as well <laughs> in this game. But this sort of opened the floodgates for Michelle's second half of the season yeah. because from this point onwards, she's largely been un unstoppable. First player to do it in the history of the league. Such a much-loved figure in Canberra. And, yeah, in my eyes, I couldn't go past that. We'd no though. sooner celebrated her century exactly. and started drawing up the graphics <laughs> when we were like, oh, 101, yeah, we're add, back. Add one. Yeah. <laughs> Mine was a rainy midweek night at Leichhardt Oval, but after a red card to Sarah Langman... Outfielders in goal, they always create fun. We call this the Chaos League for a reason. Ash Irwin, the defender, puts on the gloves, goes into goal, concedes uh, almost immediately with a moment that uh, suggests that it was an outfielder in goal, and yet the Central Coast Mariners rallied. Ergamal in the 100th minute puts away the rebound from a penalty. And if these two meet again in finals, that's the most recent time they squared off against each other. A really dramatic and memorable game. So great. <laughs> and also, as random as I would expect from you, Teo, thank you <laughs> remembering that rainy <laughs> midweek night. More than 390 goals scored across the course of this season. Grace Gill, you get first dibs on this because you have 100% done your research this week. What was your favourite goal? I really, really enjoyed Cass Davis's goal in round three against the Western <laughs> Sydney Wanderers. This is Cass Davis. We've got to remember a player who saw so many games back to back to back. She doesn't score many, but when she does, this is the 92nd minute oh. of this game against the Wanderers to equalise, get them a point, and now look where they are. 
in finals, Newcastle Jets, Cass Davis, what an absolute screamer. And uh, for me, we talked about Paul Temple's small ball for so much from show one all the way until show number 22. I think this was its zenith, a full field counter attack, Alyssa Wynnum with a brilliant assist and Perth Glory cut to ribbons. And Michaela Robertson gets the credit for the goal, but this was really the culmination of everything Wellington did through the course of the year. Absolutely brilliant. And uh, when they were on, they were one of the best teams to watch. So we've got a week off for the international break, then elimination finals. What I want to know is for that A-League women's final on Saturday, May 4, Teo Palazzeri, who's playing that day? We've already seen them play for one trophy so far this season. It was a guardrail. Oh. I think we are going to get the F3 derby in the grand final. I'm, I am saying Chef. expect the unexpected. It is going to be Central Coast Mariners against the Newcastle Jets. As a Newcastle Ooh. girl, I can't decide whether to be delighted about that tale or really scared that you've just put the mockers on both teams. Grace, what do you think? I think we're going to see a rematch of this afternoon's game. Sydney FC, Melbourne victory to meet again in the final. Cannot wait. There is a whole heap to come. Thank you for your company throughout the Dub Zone season. A few shout outs as well because we have had such an incredible season. It's been a really tough season for a number of people in our game as well. To Graham and Dan and the team at GA, thank you for your passion and energy that you've invested in the women's game this season. Gigi, you were a part of the round that Dan Hemingway and the team pulled off where we had all female commentators and pundits across an entire round of Liberty A-League. We don't think it's been done across Australian football broadcasts in any code in the past. How yep. special was that to be involved well, in? Well, quite overwhelming, really emotional, to be part of that, to be uh, setting the standard for women's sport going forward and to have those those people pushing behind us and supporting us through that process. Um, well, I'm incredibly grateful and it, it was such a, a watershed moment in our sport. It was such an incredible weekend. Dave Weiner and Paul Meltz have been massive supporters of Dub Zone since the very beginning as well. DW and Meltzy, thank you for your, all your support. And behind the scenes here each weekend, we have Rog and Sam and Maddie in particular who are looking after us and making sure that we get to air and get to share the stories from across the women's game. So a big shout out to them as well to you, Gigi, and to Teo, and to Ish, and Nulls, and Teresa as well. We have loved bringing you the stories from the women's game right throughout the regular season. Enjoy the finals. We'll see you on the hill throughout the final series to enjoy it with you. We cannot wait. We'll see you again soon.